issue here. There's a lot of strife going on in the world, obviously. And, uh, but it's not supposed to be allowed in the church. I had an old preacher one time say to me, he said, if your wife gets upset, she gets really upset, just tell her to calm down and everything will be okay right away. And then he laughed really loud. <laughs> And I thought, boy, that's so true. It just not, doesn't work that way, does it? And uh, it doesn't work with us. And it takes us a while for us to calm down. And I've often told people, if you're having some strife, uh, walk away for a while, have a time of prayer, get your own heart right, and encourage the other person to do, do the same, and then come together and begin with the hug and kiss, provided it's your wife. <laughs> Uh, things will go a lot better. Strife in the church. The Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 says, Let nothing, let nothing be done through strife. Now there was doctrinal strife, there was personality strife, there was all kinds of strife issues going on in the church. And it goes on today. I mean, probably uh, someone said that the book of Acts is the history of the tensions of Christianity uh, as it began. And it continues throughout all of time. We live within the tensions of Christianity, the constant flux from without, and of course the internal struggles of personality issues within. So that word strife there in Ephesians or Philippians 2.3, from uh, the Greek word uh, erethea, and it means factions, parties, or cliques. We talked about this the last time we got together here on Philippians. And we are not to allow this to exist in the church. We're to put an end to it. Stop it. And the ministry of the local church, along with both the propagation and protection, propagation and protection, of the doctrines of Christ are not to be accomplished through party politics and self-seeking factions of people. Otherwise, these things aren't done over in the corner with one group over here and then this other group who is opposing it, they get over here and these two and then they come together butt heads. It's a public open forum and it is intended to be directed or we would say uh, there is an intermediary that is to settle the matter. That, of course, is the pastor, and we'll look at that in a while. Now, should the pastor be drifting off somewhere, then it takes the responsibility of leadership in the church. So the stand for right doctrine, or orthodoxy, first stands alone with Christ. If you're orthodox, you're going to stand alone with Christ. And then it gathers only those who also stand for that same orthodoxy. We have it in our doctrinal statement as like precious faith. Otherwise, we believe the same things. Now, there's going to be always diversity. You bring 100, 100 pastors, a Baptist pastor together, and you're going to have a lot of diversity in all of these issues, just as you do in a local church. We're not talking about un unanimity. I mean, there are going to be variations of belief, but when it comes to the main issues of the Christian faith, uh, the deity of Christ, the inspiration of the Word of God, um, various doctrines, the indwelling of the Spirit of God, the baptism with the Spirit, the doctrine of the Church, the doctrine of pneumatology and eschatology, the doctrine of the end times, there ought to be some a considerable amount of agreement on these areas. Now granted, <clears throat> there is a fellowship created between those standing with Christ, but that fellowship is first generated by loyalty to Christ and right doctrine. Then those in that fellowship share fellowship with Christ. So what, what am I saying here? Never in my objective of life is it ever to be in fellowship with anyone else. That's not my primary objective. My primary objective is to maintain my fellowship with Christ. 
Because that's where my power comes from. That's where my illumination of the spirit comes from. So if I'm in, uh, if I'm in fellowship with Christ and Daniel is in fellowship with Christ, then we can have fellowship together. But there has to be some commonality for that unity to take place. And that's the unity of the spirit. Today we are taking away the unity, doctrinal unity, for a false unity. So let's say Daniel and I are agree doctrinally, and we equally have been empowered by the spirit of God because we uh, uh, not just because we agree, but because we're in fellowship with Christ. And then Ezra, he comes along and and uh, we uh, we say, well, Ezra's a good guy. How do we test whether or not Ezra is in fellowship with Christ? How do we test that? Should there be a test for it? Yeah, because we... If we're going to have fellowship with Christ, uh, Ezra, let's say he wants to become a member of the church. He wants to become part of our fellowship, right? So we have to test him. What's the first thing we have to test him? Doctrine. And, well, doctrine, sure. But what's the first thing we have to test him? Salvation. Is he born again? Does he have a good, solid testimony of salvation? What's the second area in which we want to test him? Okay, baptism. Is he, is, is he desirous and committed to living a sanctified life? Uh, is, he, is he old to, to crucify, to, not to cru crucify the old man, Christ did that, but to dying daily to the old man and living for Christ? Is he, is he committed to that? What's the third area of test? Not that he knows all things because he's a pretty young Christian yet, but what's the third test? Is he committed to his own discipleship? Does he attend church? Does he pray? Uh, does he, is he involved in evangelism? Those are all parts of our test of fellowship. So we're talking about salvation, sanctification, and practice. All of these things are tests of fellowship. Then the last is, what's his doctrine? What's his doctrine about other issues before we can have fellowship with, with him? So these are all tests of fellowship. However, favoritism to a party or faction cannot allow to be take, to, to, take, uh, to take president. I like Ezra. How about you guys? You like Ezra? How many like Ezra? Almost everybody, Ezra, you, you got you, you, everybody likes you. But is just because we like him, are we going to compromise for him? No, we can't. So if we want to help him, if we really love him, then we can't compromise the truth to do that. And we can't compromise our relationship with Christ in order to have fellowship with him. So therefore, God has put one man... To rule over any local church. Now people just hate that term today. But it's a biblical terminology. He is the one that. He, he, not, he's not to allow this. Okay. Not letting this strife. Uh, dominate in our church. Now we have all kinds of issues today. That people make pet doctrines out of. And I mean if they want to believe them. That's fine. But we're not going to let the church be divided. Over some of these issues. So the bishop or overseer, presbyteros, oh no, episcopos, the, the bishop of a local church is to stand against and guard against allowing factions to dominate any local congregation of believers. And local church congregations are to be conciliatory towards his leadership. Who's the one that's supposed to be the expert? <laughs> right. Now, granted, uh, there are pastors who abuse the position, take advantage of it, and are, are not conciliatory. They're lords over God's sheep, and I, I, I understand that. As a pastor, I have tried to help many people that have come out of those churches over the years, and praise God, I've uh, been able to help them. It takes many times, many years to help them. The 
They'd come out of a congregation where they'd been beat up on or lorded over. And one pastor I uh, was told of in a church here in Minneapolis that even went into the home of the wife of a deacon and inspected her underwear drawer to make sure she wasn't wearing inappropriate underwear. And if I'd have been that guy's husband, that gal's husband, I'd have thrown him out the front door, and then uh, you know jumped on his back, and he landed on the, on the sidewalk. But these kind of fruitcakes are out there. I mean, it's bizarre what goes on in the name of Christ today. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about being an intermediary between fact, uh, um, factions or parties that are are having a disagreement. You come and you sit in the middle of that and, and you arbitrate it. And you hear both sides of it and you may cor be correcting both sides. You may be correcting the doctrine from both sides. You may be correcting the attitude with both sides. But if there are people who are in the member of a local church and they have come in and accepted you as pastor, they have to accept that arbitration in regard to strife issues as well. If not, don't call, don't call me pastor. If you don't believe I'm your pastor. Now what does that mean? Go to Hebrews 13, 7 with me. Now, here we're talking about dealing with issues of strife in the church. Who's, who's supposed to take care of these things? Now there are some issues in the church that I let the deacons handle. And some of those are things that need to be investigated thoroughly and, and uh, you know, I want the I want a group of men to handle it or a group of people to handle it because I want them to come back and say, okay, here's what we've investigated, here's what we've discovered. This is the evidence of, from all the witnesses, and now, now here's what we I think what we need to do. We need to present this to this person, and either he or she either needs to repent and uh, admit it before the church what they've done and, and uh, turn from it, or uh, we are going to have to take other action. But here's the pastor. He's the one, he's the overseer. He's the one who's overseeing it all. And so oftentimes I'll appoint some people who are familiar with the situation to go and investigate it. So here it says in verse 13, or verse 7 of chapter 13 of Hebrews, remember, uh, otherwise don't forget, be mindful, or more commonly in our Eng uh, modern English, Mind. Now, um, Gina, when your children were growing up, did they always mind you? Not always, did they, right? And, uh, you know, that's part of everything. But that's really what this word means. Remember, mind your pastor. Well, you know, listen to him. Of course, have a different word in verse 17. But uh, remember, mind them which have the rule over you. Now, good disciples or followers follow spiritual leaders that God gifts to the churches as long as they're faithful to Christ and in his word. Ephesians 4.11, Paul said it like this, be the followers together of me as I am a follower of Christ. One might say, if I, if I drift off that pathway, don't follow me anymore. I, don't, I wouldn't expect it. So if I get carnal blow my top or say things which are not appropriate. Of course, none of me, nobody here ever does that, right? No one here ever gets angry. No one ever says things that they wish they wouldn't have said, right? So if the pastor does that, let's string him up immediately. Right? Well, you know, that's those things are all part of our carnal nature. Now, obviously the pastor should be more under control and those things should not happen often. But they do. And uh, then they need to be dealt with appropriately. Forgiveness, confession, um, remorse, all ought to be there. But uh, it should be forgiven. So he says, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. Now faith in the Bible is not what you believe. It, it is what you believe, but it is uh, it is a word meaning the practice of what you believe. Faith is not just what you believe, it is the practice of what you believe. So I want to hear it says, one, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith, the practice of what they believe, 
follow. Considering the end of their conversation, their manner of living. Otherwise, consider the outcome of their life and their goals and, the, and, and all of those things. So what is their purpose for existence as a pastor? Well, it's to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry and uh, be, of course, helpful to people growing in grace. Now, those are important things, but we don't end there. Now, it comes down to verse 17. It all goes down there. Now, in the context of this, it's written to Jews who are thinking about going back to the temple and abandoning the church, abandoning their pastoral leadership to go back to the priesthood of Israel for their leadership. And so in this last admonition, he's already said in chapter 12, uh, you know, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is, and even more so as you see the day of Christ approaching. Don't forsake the church for the temple. That's a concept. We use that to have people should come to church services. Well, of course they should. That's a given. But in this context, that's what it is. Don't forsake that church to go back to the temple. And... Uh, Otherwise, that's, your, your, that's a medium God has ordained for this dispensation. Look at verse 17. Here is something else. Obey then. Now, we don't have to look up the Greek word for that. It's pretty obvious what it means, right? Obey them that have the rule over you. Now, I've had people say to me, well, this is talking about government and police and um, you know, all of those other issues like Romans 13. No, it's not. It's very contextually defined as a pastor. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. And they must give account. Otherwise, it's not something that I take lightly. I, I, got, I, I, I know it's like walking on a bed of eggs. When you do this. Because you have to deal with it firmly. But yet at the same time you have to be careful. Because you don't want to lose the people to the world. Or you abandon the church and walk out. Because they have the right people vote with their feet. And uh, they leave the church. But then you can't help them anymore. And probably many times when that happens. They don't go to church anywhere, anywhere. Any, anywhere at any time anymore. And it's ended. Now they got a heart problem. And they want to help with the heart problem, but the heart's closed to you. For they watch for your souls, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that's unprofitable to you. What's that mean? You're going to answer for it. You're going to answer for these things. Now, these are pretty critical texts when we talk about strife in the church. It's got to be dealt with. Now, is a pastor the only one that should deal with strife in the church? Where did, where, where's the first line of defense against strife in the church? I, I, I want to say something. Um, is the pastor the only one that deals with strife? Mm -hmm. Well, um, let's say that, I don't know how to word this, so let's, let, let's say that you have, I go to a Bible study, and I have um, some problems. So I'm sharing this with a group of ladies. Uh, and it's not kept there. It's not what? It's not kept there. Oh, sure. It's being gossiped afterwards to certain, to, to certain individuals. Mm -hmm. So how free, I, uh, how free are we when we, when we, Go and talk to a person that makes sure that it's kept within the church, even though they're Christians. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, to some yeah, to some degree, I think. First of all, when it comes to things that you need help with, don't make it a group. Uh, share it with a group. Right. Find find one person you trust and talk to that one person. Those aren't the if you don't want something to be shared publicly, don't share it publicly. Because that's what a, you know, essentially a Bible study is. And all it takes is one person. We're to confess our faults one to another, but not our sins or failures. And so I always say, if you want to keep it private, keep it as private as you want to keep it private. That's a mouthful of privates, but you know what I'm, I'm saying. 
I have certain people to which I am, I, I share intimate things with. How does that compare if you have a problem with random from Russia? Does he tell anybody that I got this problem? Yeah, confessing your faults to the church is obviously you've just made it public, but people shouldn't be gossiping about it behind your back in order to criticize you or say, well, look at this problem she's got. No, we should be conciliatory. Otherwise, we want to be helpful. And we shouldn't be self-righteous because even though you have your problem with whatever your problem is, I've got my own problems with the things I have problems with. And for me to look down my nose at you because you have a problem with what you have by problem, and for me, uh, and then not deal with my own, that is essentially what Christ is talking about when he says, judge not lest you be judged. Because you've got to judge righteous judgment. Judge, righteous judgment is to understand you got your problems, I got mine. My job is to help you with yours, and your job is to help me with mine. <laughs> well, yeah, that's why God gave me a wife. <clears throat> She's been helping me with him for 50 eight years now. But, uh, but it should be man to man and woman to woman. I believe so. Yeah, it's the best situation. I'm never going to go share anything intimate with another woman other than my wife. But I do have maybe some men and men who have come to me with issues that they're struggling with, and we form a, an accountability relationship. But I'm not going to judge that person and say, well, you lousy, wicked, horrible person. You're the only one in the church that's got that problem. No, I'm going to understand because more than likely a lot of people have the same problem. So, John? Well, there's an old saying, if they will talk to you about someone... They will talk about you too, someone. Yes. And these old sayings are not there just for heaven's sake. Yeah. They're, I mean, that's what happens. Yeah, if you hate gossip, don't be a person who listens to it. No. You know, and rebuke the person who gives it to you. And one of the first things somebody says, did you know this about this person? I said, have you talked to that person about it? You've gone to them and talked to them about it. No, don't talk to me about it. I'll be very firm. Don't talk to me about it and don't talk to someone else about it until you've gone to them and talked to them about it. And be conciliatory. That's how you deal with strife. Now, that as a pastor, I, de I deal with that all the time. So there's strife in the church and somebody comes to me and says, well, I heard this about such and so. I said, have you talked to them about it? No, I said, don't talk to me about it. I'm dealing with the strife. And then I say, and don't talk to anybody else about it. And I'm going to let that be an issue of strife in the church. Now, is that being harsh? No, it's being firm. There's a difference, Brian. My mentality is always, I, I don't want people talking about me behind my back. So I'm not going to talk about other people behind yeah. my back. And yeah. I'm not going to talk about other people behind my back. There are differences when a pastor is dealing with doctrinal issues and there are times when names have to be named. And because they pose a threat to that local congregation, and it doesn't, it's not unnecessarily healthy just to deal with the general issue um, because most people in the church, I say most people, many people in the church are simpletons. But that simply means they're not grounded in the word of God. And so they may not be able to identify the issue, but they can identify the person and say, okay, I'm not going to listen to that person. So you have to name the names. I do that with television ministries because I name the names. I don't want people listening to that junk on TV. Yeah, they, they say some good things. You know, I can say that just about many of the preachers on TV. They, they have some good things to say. I'm not concerned about the good things. It's the bad things that they want they're going to say and, and will bring strife into the church. So when someone comes to me, I had a couple that were visiting the church one day and they said, well, what do you think of Joel Olstein?" I said, I think he's a rotten, stinking scoundrel and he, he's a, he leads people astray and stay away from him. Well, they didn't come back again. But... I didn't want them to come into the church either and bring that stuff in. Now, I, I, uh, you know, this, this, I could spend a lot of time on this. I'm not going to. <laughs> uh -huh. 
So let's come back here to our any other comments this morning. Uh, unfortunately, true purity of fellowship between believers, often, usually, degenerates into compromises for some type of quasi-unity to retain friendships and pseudo-fellowship with pseudo means false within a group under the guise of fellowship with Christ. This is what I dealt with within the Minnesota Baptist Association, although it wasn't necessarily uh, true throughout all of the churches. It was being prop propagated in what was being called gospel centrism, mainly coming out of Fourth Baptist and the Seminary, uh, uh, Central Baptist Seminary. But uh, they come under this guise of unity when there's no real unity, and in the guise of fellowship when there's no real fellowship. This dynamic is something every local church has to guard against, including our little church. And Christ warned that loyalties to families and friends above loyalties to what he was taught was tantamount to treason to the cause of Christ and thereby denying being the disciples of, of Christ. If, if you are willing to compromise the doctrines of Christ for some for fellowship with one else, you are in treason and you are being a false disciple of Christ, which means you are not a disciple of Christ. You're not following him anymore. Because Christ wouldn't do that. <laughs> so Jesus expects radically extreme loyalty to him and his teachings for those wanting to be called his disciples. Are you a Christian? Many people I ask that out in the street. Well, most people today in churches all over our city would be saying, well, I'm a Christian. When in fact you're not. And there could be people sitting even in our own church auditorium who say, well, I'm a Christian. But they're not, because you're not following the doctrines of Christ. To be a disciple or to be a Christian is to be a disciple. And to be a disciple is to be follower, is a follower of the teachings of Jesus. Rightly divided the truth. Now, if you wrongly divide the truth, then you're no longer a follower of Christ and you no longer are a Christian. I'm not talking about being saved. Because there are a lot of saved people who aren't Christians. A Christian is a follower of the teachings of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, Christ deals with this. He says, you find that? Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever. Now we like that word when we use it in the context of anybody being able to be saved. But the term is intended to be all-inclusive. That's what whosoever means. Everybody, anybody. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Now, what's that word confess mean? It's a Greek word, homologeo. And it means to agree with. So when you confess Jesus before men, you are agreeing with Jesus about who he is and what he taught. That defines a Christian. You must agree with Jesus of who he is and what he taught. That is why you must carefully evaluate the local church in which you attend because it must teach right doctrine before it can be Christian. And then look at verse 33. But whosoever, everybody, anybody, and all people, whosoever shall deny me before men. How do you deny Christ? Well, Peter did. He denied him first by saying, I don't know him. Then he denied him by cursing and using foul language because that would no longer be in alignment with following Christ. And, you know, there was a digression there he says whosoever shall deny me before men him will I also deny before my father which is in heaven I won't testify to you you won't testify for me I won't testify for you that is the advocacy otherwise uh, I won't intercede for you think not that I am come to send peace on the earth I came not to send peace but a sword what's a sword do 
If I take my sword and hit you uh, as hard as I can with the sharp edge across your arm, what's going to happen? It's going to divide your arm from the rest of your body. If I take my sword and hit you across the neck uh, with that sword as hard as I can, it's going to divide your head from the body. So what is he talking about? He says, uh, I come not to send peace, but a sword. Doctrine will divide. Now, you can heal false doctrine, right? By teaching people the truth. But when someone professes false doctrine, I, I might have to say to them, well, no, that's not right. And if you let me sit down and with you across from the kitchen table, I can show you what's true. I can explain to you what the word of God, and I think I could pretty much overwhelm you with truth to what, what truth is. Not going to be just one verse of scripture or two here. I can overwhelm you with the scripture to persuade you what the truth is if you want to know the truth. But uh, Christ, he said, he didn't come to bring division. He brought, he came uh, to bring peace, unity. And so when the word of God is rightly divided and someone knows what they're talking about, and people are willing to listen, otherwise for just a moment, set, a, set aside what they do believe, to come and listen to what the Word of God teaches, they can be persuaded. So he says in verse 35, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father. Notice, this, notice the words against here. Underline them in your Bible. The daughter against her mother. The daughter-in-law against, against her mother-in-law, a man's foe shall be those of his own household. How many of you have experienced this? We know this is true. That doesn't mean I, I in any way change my love for my family or my friends. I love them even more deeply. But I can't just be neutral in regard to what the differences are, what divides us. I have to help them to, to come to Christ. And some of my family have come to Christ as we've witnessed this to them. But we see here a man's foe should be those of his own household. What's a foe? Enemy. Enemy? Yes, yeah, someone who opposes you. So the people who oppose you shall be those of his own household. At the time of the early church, they had people uh, who, of the same, member, same family who were, in order to avoid persecution, they, they uh, exposed their family members who were Christians and got them killed. So they could retain you know, their wealth and homes. They didn't want to be associated with them because if they were associated with them, they killed the whole family. Now look at here. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. That means if you're not willing to die for Christ, you're not worthy of Christ. Certainly, if you're not willing to stand alone for Christ or with others who stand with you against those who oppose Christ, that's a pretty sad testimony. It certainly shows you that you are not a Christian. You might be saved, but you're not a Christian. You're not a follower of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Questions or comments you have on that? John. So the first, verse 32, confessing me before men, and I will confess you before my father. Is that a saved person? I believe it is. It is a, the extension is found in Romans chapter 10 and uh, um, verse 9. You know, if if we believe in the heart, confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. It is a confessing, agreeing with with the word of God, agreeing with Jesus who he, he is, and confessing that he is God and publicly acknowledging that he is Lord. So Publicly identify with Jesus. So the person in verse 32 is not a Christian because he will not confess Christ. 
Yes, you're not a Christian if you will not confess Christ. That is a, that is a, um, the third verb in Romans chapter 10. Uh, confess, uh, repent, believe, confess, and call. So you're not a Christian if you're not willing to publicly confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord. When do you think Peter was saved? Well, it's speculation. And there's a lot of people who say, well, I have a testimony like me. I have a testimony. I got saved back in 1969. I went forward and prayed the pray, prayer. I'm not sure that's when I got saved. But people say, are you saved? I know for sure I'm saved today because of that. And if we were to follow the pattern of, of Peter, uh, Christ didn't go back to Peter at the Sea of Galilee and say, now, Peter, you need to repent, believe, confess, call, and receive. He said, you need to start doing what you were called to do. So Peter's failure to confess Christ was a disloyalty to him. That does not mean he had not been confessed Christ and been born again already. Uh, of course, there's transitional issues here in, disp in the dispensations, but uh, I don't know exactly when Peter got saved. I do know in Acts chapter 2, we're dealing with a saved Peter. So that's what's important. Did Peter fail after that? A number of times, yes. So did that mean he needed to get saved again? No, <laughs> I don't think so. I think he needed to repent of his failure and get back on, on track, yes. I think I heard you say once that you think Peter was the apostle of the Gentiles, but he failed, and so Paul became the apostle of the Gentiles. Did I hear you say that? <clears throat> I don't think he ever um, was faithful in his commission to the, you know, he was sent out to the Gentiles. And when he went out, remember that accountant in the book of Acts where um, he's hungry and God brings a sheet down from heaven. And uh, he said, no, I've never eaten anything unclean. And, and then God says, don't call what I have made clean, unclean. So transition, that would have been a, Gentile issue. So he was sent out to reach the Gentiles, but did not do so and struggled with it all of his life. All the other, almost all of the other apostles stayed at Jerusalem for a long time. So Paul, who was the most Jewish of all of them, was the theologian of all of them. Uh, Christ calls him takes him into Arabia for three years and teaches him the truth from a theologian's perspective. Otherwise, from correcting false theology and making it right theology, and then he sends him out, sends him out to the Gentiles. Did Paul only go to the Gentiles? Yeah, he went to almost every place he started to church, he went into the synagogues and preached just as Jesus did. But the majority of the people he did bring to Christ were Gentiles. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Correct. Romans 10, uh, verse 5. And then Jesus is speaking. Romans 10? Romans 10. Okay. Matthew 10. Matthew 10. Okay. Okay. Yeah, initially they were not to go to the Gentiles. Initially they were to go to the household of Israel. Well, eventually they have a dispensational transition. And initially, this was, you remember, the, here's something that's difficult for many people to understand. The Gospels are still Old Testament books. So he wants to see and make sure that the Jews get saved. The transition takes place um, much later in the book of Acts. Now the church begins in Acts chapter 2. That is when the Spirit of God is released and the house is filled and the people are filled with the Spirit of God. And that's a, that's a church transitional issue. Now Christ began the church before that, but the official beginning of the church is in Acts chapter Two with the release of Christ's spirit to indwell believers. So then at that time, the 
almost everybody on that day in Acts chapter 2 were Jews who got saved. That was the day of Pentecost. And for a considerable time after that, the majority of people who got saved are Jews. But then missions begin. And most of the time when missions begin, they're sent out to reach the Gentiles. And Peter is one of those first ones that are sent out to reach the Gentiles. Part of that, too, is that we have to have fulfillment of prophecy where the Jewish nation rejects Christ. As, right. As a whole group. So that then he then takes on the Gentile. And Peter says that in one of his books about the rock which they disallow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and let me ask you this question in what Fred is saying. How many Jews were already saved when um, before Christ died, buried, and was resurrected. Were there Jews that were saved? Was, yeah, but they were looking for and had their faith in the coming Messiah. And were there Jews around the world who didn't know that Jesus, there weren't any TVs or radios or internet were there Jews that maybe had gotten saved and then moved off into some of the Gentile nations maybe and were living out there who were saved Jews who uh, hadn't heard that Jesus was crucified and, and risen from the dead? Were they still? Huh? Exactly. There's one perfect example. We have many of them. You know, there were probably many of them could be anywhere in the world. Do they need to get saved again? No, they were saved, just like you and I are saved. Well, what was the difference? In order to be part of the church, they had to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And then they had to believe that he died for them and that um, they had to be baptized into the local church. So that's a transitional issue. Is that true today? Is there anybody like that today? No, that was a transitional issue that changed in Acts chapter 2 and probably throughout the book of Acts. So when Paul's going into the synagogue, many times he's preaching to save Jews who now needed to recognize that Jesus was the Messiah, that he had come. He had finished what the Old Testament prophecies had spoken he was going to do. John. Oh, faith because he righteousness was credited to him. Yeah. Because he believed God. Yes. Yeah. So they were Old Testament saved people. There were people like that, and transitionally at the time of of Christ and the beginning of the apostles. So when Christ is saying, go to the household of Israel, as Fred is saying, what's he want to do? Go to those people who are Jews and make sure they understand, wherever they are in the world, make sure they understand that the Messiah, me, I have come, I've died for sins, I have propitiated God's wrath, and I have uh, opened the door for justification through faith that I promised I would give you, and now you can receive the Holy Spirit. Remember in Acts, there were those who said, well, uh, have, you, uh, have you received the Spirit? And, and they said, well, we, we didn't even know there was such a thing. Well, they were already saved, but now they had to receive the Spirit in order to be part of the church age, part of this new dispensation. So then to answer your question, Fred, or is that too complex? Yeah, I said no. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, mostly no. Yeah, well, the, the point is that the Jews were originally sent to the household of Israel and they wanted to see the Jews get saved. They wanted to see those saved Jews understand that Jesus was the Messiah. His work was now finished and they could trust in him and receive the indwelling spirit of Christ or the baptism with the spirit. That were being imputed and imparted God. Yes, yeah, they had already had imputed righteousness. Now they, would, now they could receive the impartation of righteousness and the indwelling Holy Spirit. Uh, and so those transitional people, wherever they might be, had to hear of Christ. They had to hear of his finished work of redemption. They had to believe in him and understand that. And of course, the Spirit of God would lead them to do that. 
And that's why on that day of Pentecost, 5,000 of them got saved. A few days later, 3,000 more get saved. And so they're, you know, they're getting saved all over the place. When we say saved, they're, they're coming into the new covenant. For instance, we're spending a lot of time on this, but that's okay. Um, when Jesus calls his disciples, was he calling lost men to be saved, or was he calling saved men to be disciples? Okay, so none of the, uh, all the uh, disciples, when Jesus called them, they weren't lost people. Who, are, who, are, who were they already disciples of? John the Baptist. So they'd already been baptized in an Old Testament sense, and now they were baptized in that sense, looking in the in down just a short pathway of history, looking for the coming of the Messiah, because that's what John the Baptist was for. He came to announce that the Messiah was close. He was coming. He was here. And so he was out baptizing believers who had already were Old Testament believers, baptizing them. Uh, and that what did he say? I said, I baptize you with water, but there is one amongst you who will baptize you, whose, whose shoe latched I'm not worthy to, to, to lose, uh, who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So he's saying that there's coming that day, and he's right. He's right here. He's amongst us. And uh, of course, he was there to announce the Messiah. So those Jews were watching for them. They were already saved. Those Pharisees that came to John the Baptist who wanted to be baptized, what did he say to them? <laughs> he said, "You generation of vipers, unless you repent, what do they have to repent of?" Works they had to repent of their dead ritualism and their and their works of the law. So unless you repent of that, you, you shall all likewise perish. But they weren't they weren't saved. He wouldn't baptize them. Am I oversimplifying it by saying today we look back to the Messiah in faith? Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, they look forward to the Messiah in faith. No, you're not oversimplifying it. That's exactly the truth. That's exactly what it is. Everybody from Genesis 3.15 looks forward to that promise being fulfilled. Everybody after the cross looks back to that promise having been fulfilled and trusting in it. That's the substance of Hebrews 10, 10, 12, 14, and 18 where the remission of these is there is no more offering for sin. These are all critical texts and they're great tools to help evangelize people because remember the vast majority of people in the churches in our community are like the Jews. They're still trusting in their own ritualism, their church membership, their own works for salvation, their baptism, their sacraments for salvation, just, just like they just like the Jews did, the, the not not all the Jews. The majority of the Jews had, who were saved Jews had abandoned the temple. Because the priesthood was corrupted, the sacrifices were corrupted anyway. And so they weren't even there. John the Baptist was one of those. That's why he was in the wilderness. Now these are tremendously important questions. I apologize. I probably didn't answer them as well and as thoroughly as I can. I try to give a short answer as short as I can. But the short answer almost always turns into a long answer. And I can see the eyes begin to glass over. <laughs> I apologize for it. But uh, it is uh, no light issue, right? So, amen. Uh, did you have something, Gina? Anything else this morning? Okay, we'll close in prayer and pick this up next week. Lord God, thank you today for the great promises of your word. And Lord, we are so uh, appreciative of, of uh, how much scripture that you give us and how much uh, truth that's there for us to I look upon and use. We thank you for your grace in that matter. We pray, Lord, that you'd help each of the people here today understand what we taught and what your spirit wants us to know. In Jesus' name, amen.